Welcome to this forum for candidates running for Minnesota House of Representatives, District 35A. House District 35A covers Anoka and Ramsey. I'm Linda Rogers of the Anoka Blaine Coon Rapids Area League of Women Voters, and the league sponsors this forum, along with our co-sponsors, the North Suburban Optimist Club and the North Metro Chamber of Commerce. A quick note to those of you who have watched Meet the Candidates over the years, the COVID situation necessitated a couple of changes. There is no live audience. We are taping this forum with a skeleton crew appropriately spaced and masked off camera. Also, we are taping early in the election season so that all voters can have information about, vote, about candidates before casting their votes. All candidates were invited to this forum. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose any political parties or candidates for office. The League does help citizens become informed voters and advocates for important issues. So that's what this evening is all about, informing voters. If you're interested in joining the League or just learning more about it, visit our webpage at lwvabcmn.org. Women and men and young people are invited to join. For the position of House District 35A, the candidates are incumbent John Heinrich and challenger Mike Erickson. The candidates will start by, in, by answering three introductory questions that were supplied to them in advance. These will be followed by questions submitted by the public via our website and questions of importance to the League of Women Voters, North Suburban Optimist Club, and North Metro Chamber of Commerce. We will end with closing statements from the candidates. Answers are limited to one minute, and candidates will take turns being the first to answer a question. I'll hand it over to our moderator, Karen Varian. Thanks. I'm Karen Varian a League of Women Voters member and a resident of Blaine. I'd like to welcome the House District 35A candidates, John Heinrich and Mike Erickson. We're gonna to start today with the questions the candidates were given in advance, and you'll have one minute per question to respond. Describe your background and community involvement. We'll start with John Heinrich. Thank you, Karen, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting these forums. And thank you to the, the skeleton crew and the people that are here and to those of you watching at home. Uh, background starts off, uh, I was actually born in Arizona. And when I was six years old, my parents moved to Coon Rapids, Minnesota. So I grew up in Coon Rapids, uh, went to Meadow Creek Christian School, uh, graduated in, at, from Meadow Creek in 1998, first through 12th grade there. And then I joined the Marine Corps, uh, spent seven years or eight years in the Marine Corps, uh, 1999 through 2007, served in Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003 and four, and some time in Honduras as well. Uh, since then, I've been in the asphalt industry and I do asphalt and concrete work for a living. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Jessica, for 14 years and we have three children and we live in Anoka. Uh, so again, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been an honor to serve as your state representative for the last couple years. And uh, I look forward to winning your vote again this November. Thank you. Mike Erickson. Yeah, I'd like to thank the League also for sponsoring this event and giving us the opportunity to speak more or less directly to the constituents of 35A. I'm Mike Erickson and my wife Jody Anderson and I have lived in Anoka for over 30 years. We raised our two children here and we're both very active in the community. I volunteered in the public school system and in my church and I coached several sports through the uh, community athletic associations. I hold bachelor's degrees in math and business administration and a master's degree in international management. I worked in the defense industry for over 30 years as a systems engineer, a program manager, and eventually retiring as a senior leader in Lockheed Martin's Underseas Systems Division. I'm also a Navy veteran. I retired as a captain after nearly 30 years of combined active and reserve service. I think of all the things I love about the area, my favorite is the big parade of the little people at Halloween. I marched every year when my kids were little, 
and I think I still have the distinction of being the biggest teenage mutant ninja turtle that Anoka has ever seen. Thanks. Why are you seeking this office? We'll start with Mike Erickson. Yeah, so I believe leadership has both magnitude, strong versus weak, and direction, right versus wrong. And while I don't doubt the strength of the, their leadership, the past years have made it clear that today's Republican Party is leading the country and the state in the wrong direction. I became concerned that if some of their extreme conservative rhetoric around things like women's rights or conversion therapy became policy, that it would limit the opportunities available to my granddaughter and her generation to grow and develop into their own true selves. When I announced my run for office, I invoked the words of the first Republican president when he expressed his hope that this nation would experience a new birth of freedom and that the government of the people, by the people, and for the people would not perish from the earth. Today's Republican Party has strayed from those ideals, and I realized I wouldn't be able to enjoy retirement if I didn't do everything possible to restore those ideals and preserve my granddaughter's future. Thank you. John Heinrich. Thank you. So uh, it's been an honor to serve in the last couple years here in the state legislature. And my priorities are going to continue to be uh, our community here, get, being a good advocate for our community. I represent the cities of Anoka and most of Ramsey and District 35A. We have uh, severe infrastructure needs, safety needs, uh, upgrades that need to happen on Highway 10. I've chief authored bills to help with that. I've worked across the aisle to help with that. And uh, along with uh, Highway 47, right over by where I live, we have some of the most, one of the most dangerous railroad track crossings in the state. Um, I got to thank our governor for coming out and highlighting that, uh, that area and, and the problem that we have there. And, uh, and he's included uh, um, that project in our, future, in our negotiations in the bonding bill. And so I want to extend a thank you to the governor for that. Um, it's been an honor to serve on the Veterans Affairs Committee as a veteran myself. That's been uh, very rewarding to do that. And I uh, actually did get a, a bill passed and signed into law by the governor for veterans. Thank you. Thank you. What are your goals for the Senate District and for the state of Minnesota? John Heinrich. So my goals for our district are, number one, we've heard it a couple times tonight, um, but public safety. And I'm talking about the public safety where we have the type of leadership here, and I'm confident that we do in Sheriff Stewart. Um, I think he's done a great job. I was in uh, conversations with him throughout the riots going on in, the, in downtown. And, uh, and I think that's something that's very important is I've been knocking doors and talking with hundreds of voters in the Anoka and Ramsey area. They wanna make sure that their businesses and their livelihoods and their property is safe. And, and so that's gonna be a major priority for me. And like I mentioned, uh, the transportation needs that we have are uh, top on the list as well. Thank you. Mike Erickson. Yeah, my goals for the state and for the district are really embodied in my campaign slogan, preserving the future and honoring the past. So both Anoka and Ramsey have storied pasts, and they've both grown through adversity, though different than the adversity that we face today. And after a devastating fire in the late 1800s, Anoka's rebuilt and is now a, a vibrant community with historic buildings and a nostalgic downtown. And Ramsey, its growth stored... Uh, uh, stalled a little bit in the late 1990s, but it too now has grown into a diverse community with wetlands and a variety of housing options and a, and a growing business district. And I, I have faith that the character of the area that was forged in that past adversity will carry us through the, the uh, unprecedented times that we're in today. But the same old solutions from the Republican Party are not going to preserve our future. That will take bold, new, innovative, creative solutions. And those solutions I'm committed to developing as your next representative. Thanks. Now we will move to on to the other questions. And just a reminder, you'll have one minute to respond. And I'll give each of you a chance to respond to the question first. So the first question is, you discussed your goals for Minnesota's future. What is the goal you would put at the top of your list, and how would you this goal be achieved? And we'll start with Mike Erickson. Yeah, so 
Education, um, you know, education has seen short shrift for several years with unfunded mandate, mandates, especially in uh, the special education world. But, you know, Einstein said that the problems that exist today cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. And we need to develop an and fully fund an educational system that will develop our next generation of critical thinkers. Um, I mentioned that, that the, the, the same old solutions uh, of the past are not going to work in the future. We need to find ways to, um, to bring teachers of color into the system. We need to find ways to remove the, the obstacles to opportunity uh, and, and reduce the opportunity gap. Um, last week at their, last month at the city council meeting, they brought a bunch of, uh, of youngsters in from Anoka High School, black youth, that expressed their experiences and what they needed. And I think, you know, they restored my faith in them. I think it's time we restore our faith to them, or their faith in us, pardon me. Don Heinrich. My message to the people of Minnesota and the people of this district is that they can do things with individual as individuals and themselves and it's a it's a message of confidence in their ability to parent and run their businesses uh, versus I feel like a lot of the time a message of uh, government might know best or a blue ribbon panel knows best and so uh, opportunity for all is something that we can engage with the community with um, I think that the um, when we try to legislate equal outcomes, I don't think it works out very well. I think there's a lot of good intentions there. Um, but if we really concentrate on uh, equality of opportunity, um, that's where we can see some success. Thank you. Please describe any experiences you have owning or managing a business, as well as specific advocacy efforts on behalf of the local small business community. John Heinrich. Well, as I mentioned, I, I do work in the asphalt and concrete industry. I've had the pleasure of serving uh, in the whole North Metro, but uh, mainly worked for a company that did seal coating, residential seal coating out of Anoka for a number of years. So um, other than just me literally on the driveways uh, serving customers, um, I've served in my church, um, helped out at Stepping Stones Emergency Housing in Anoka. Um, and I've just always had a heart for serving people, and that's why I joined the military in the first place. And uh, that's why I'm uh, confident that I can continue to, to do a good job of that in the state legislature. Mike Erickson. Yeah, so my experience with local small businesses isn't that great. Um, my, my experience with Lockheed Martin as the senior leader, I was responsible for the organization that provided customer support services. And we went to the, we, we sent technicians to the ships and they were almost always um, in, in partnership teammates with, uh, with small business. And we had several uh, mentor protege programs where Lockheed Martin as the, the biggest defense co uh, contractor in the world would mentor small businesses, give them technical guidance, introduce them to, to people in the uh, defense industry that could uh, further their business. And so that same uh, behavior, that same model can be moved here. Um, locally, I, I have been active in my church. I've been uh, part of the Board of Finance for years. And I sit on the board of directors of a, a nonprofit called SAVE, uh, Suicide Awareness Voices of Education, and have been instrumental in their uh, growth and, and their mission. If elected, what would you do to provide for a healthy business climate? Mike Erickson. Well, we need to we need to get the virus under control. I mean, it's it's not a normal business cycle here. We're not in a normal business environment, and so we can't really develop or, or reinstate a, a good business environment until we have a good health environment. So the first thing I would do is ensure that we follow the science and we follow the guidelines. There's ample evidence. Every state, every school that's opened early has had a surge in cases and deaths, and then when they reimpose the guidelines, the cases go down. So we need to get that under control. And then we're going to have to be a little innovative in, in figuring out how to support small business. There have been people in industries that have thrived during the pandemic. And I think we need to find ways to pull them in to do that uh, small business 
mentor-protege thing. I think uh, we need to find ways. You know, Wells Fargo, as, as one of the administrators of the PPP program, has said that they will donate their proceeds from that program to small businesses, and I think we need to make sure we get our share. John Heinrich. Well, a, help, a healthy business climate uh, starts with lack of extreme regulation and taxation from uh, government powers, and it also has a lot to do with um, the public safety in the area. Um, you know, if you're a if you were a minority-owned business um, in Minneapolis, uh, there was hundreds and hundreds of businesses burned in Minneapolis, and so to provide a healthy climate is is um, is a lot more than just um, you know blue ribbon panels trying to help make decisions and what they think business is best. We need to listen to our business owners. They know how to run their businesses. And it's driven by uh, demand from consumers. And I believe that consumers are, are smart, 99.9% .9 of them anyway. And so they're going to weed out the bad businesses. If you have a business that doesn't put a product together that's quality and for a good price, then people will simply choose not to go to that business. Doesn't work that way in government. Thanks. How would you use this office to promote public safety and safe interactions to minimize the spread of COVID-19? John Heinrich. Well, I'm going to request that I, I be on the public safety uh, uh, committee uh, next session. And uh, right now I serve on the transportation committee, um, government operations and veterans. And uh, public safety is very important to me. I was a military police officer in the United States Marine Corps. Um, and I, but I know that this question is more to do with COVID. And, uh, and you know, I got to agree with uh, some things that were uh, said tonight is about our governor's um, unilateral powers. Uh, we are, we're going on 160 days of emergency time powers. Um, the, the, he's not doing anything or he can't do anything that we can't do as a legislature. We are the co-equal branch. The specific reason that we elect representatives from our districts is to go to St. Paul and help make tough decisions. That's the reason we're elected. And so to say that this is too tough of a decision, we need to let one man make that decision, I think is wrong. Thank you. Mike Erickson. Um, yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier that we need to follow the science. We need to, to follow the guidelines. Um, you know, early in my career, I used to do weapon systems effectiveness analysis, and we'd use the, the physics of ballistics, internal and ex external ballistics, to assess the, the uh, effectiveness of a, a weapon system. And if we didn't get the results we wanted, we didn't go back and try and change the ballistic. We didn't go back and try and change the science. We changed the system. And right now, we want to go back and change the science. We've, we've learned a lot about COVID. We didn't know about community spread early on. We found out about it. We've encouraged masks and separation. And yet we've got a, a fairly large segment of society that refuses to simply wear a mask. And with respect to the government's executive powers, um, and I'm sure John will understand this, when you're in a firefight, you have unified leadership, one guy. You, and it's not so much that he knows better it's just that you don't have the time to consult with everybody and to get everybody's thoughts on what should happen. Governor Wallace was in the National Guard. He understands what's going on with Thanks. that. What do you see as the greatest need or challenge for youth in Minnesota, and how, as an elected official, would you help solve this issue? Um, and I think it's, that question would go to yeah. you, Mike. So I, I think in some respects it's legitimacy. I, I don't think that the youth um, feel that they are legitimate members of society and that they are, their voices are heard and that their concerns are going to be acted on. And I think that's one of the most critical things a legislator has to do is listen to all of the people. I, I mentioned earlier the six black students from Anoka that were at the city council meeting in July. Um, incredible, incredibly impressive kids. And they told us what they wanted for the future, but they also told us that they don't see it in their path. And so what we need to do is go out and talk with them, figure out uh, how can we make it so that they do see those opportunities. I talked with uh, Chief Peterson just the other day, and he said since that meeting, he's been in the high school. And so he's talking with them and going to engage that leadership group so that he can do similar, um, uh, make them feel important in, in similar ways. John Heinrich. 
Well, one thing that I, I've been supportive of, uh, Representative Dean Erdahl in the state legislature had, had a bill that would require um, civics classes in, in high school. Uh, I think a lot of our kids are being underserved in, uh, in the schools and, and not learning some of the things that were uh, maybe basics for uh, myself and, and a lot of the people in the room today. And um, uh, there's some concern out there as I, as I talk to people and I knock on doors um, that the kids are learning more about how to be um, activists. And uh, well, the term social justice warrior has been, has been thrown out there. And there's, um, you know, there's uh, just all these different intersectional um, politics going on, and, and our kids are being taught that in the schools. I just don't think that's that's the place to politicize our schools. Um, our kids, we've we've got a very drastic um, problem in our inner city schools, especially with kids being graduated that can't read. Uh, that's completely ridiculous. So we need to do a better job. Thanks. As an elected official, what would you do to ensure we have clean air and water now and into the future? John Heinrich. Well, thank you for that question. I, I agree. I think a lot of the time Republicans are painted somehow in that we don't care about clean air and water. Um, I do. I spent uh, three summers volunteering in the, in the Boundary Waters at uh, YMCA uh, of the Boundary Waters Camp to Nord, uh, led kids out on canoe trips. I have a, a deep respect and love for our environment. Um, what I don't like to see is, uh, again, overburdensome regulations that um, really kill whole communities. You have a, a large chunk of Minnesota that's, um, that's a union community, been strong blue Democrat for years. And I think it's, it might even go red this year uh, because of their frustration because they can't, they can't work like they used to. Um, and so we can do good. We have great technology coming about. And as technology ramps up, I think we're going to start to see some solutions um, that we just didn't, didn't even think could exist 10, 15 years ago. Um, and so I'm confident in that. Thank you. Mike Erickson. Yeah, some metrics are an interesting thing. We, we've got a party now that thinks that uh, uh, removing uh, regulation and, and rescinding regulations is a good thing, and they measure their, their progress by doing that, and they, they, they declare success. The problem is they don't look below the, the level of just rescinding the regulation. They don't see that we're going to be pouring tons more greenhouse gases into the air. They don't see that we're going to be pouring much more pollutants into the water. They don't, it, Donald Trump's own EPA, when they proposed the uh, um, emi new emissions control laws, said that it's going to result in over 2,000 Americans dying prematurely every year. And so the, the regulation thing is a little bit of a red herring. I agree with John. We shouldn't have overburdensome regulations, but we need to have reasonable regulations, and we put those in place to protect the environment and to, pr to protect the, the the things that we all enjoy. Thanks. Considering recent events, how would you address racism in the state? Mike Erickson. Yeah, so racism exists. And I, locally here, if you look in the county, I think uh, the growth of the black and African community has been something like over 300% compared to about 20% in the white community. Um, the, the problem that I think we have, not only here, but but pretty much pervasive is there are trigger terms and trigger words. If you use something like systemic racist or white privilege, that drives people to the to their corners and they, they get defensive and they think, well, I'm not a racist and white privilege doesn't exist. I work for everything I, I got. Um, nobody's doubting that and nobody's asking you to apologize for the circumstances of your birth. There's a young guy by the name of Ibram Kendi who's been rising in the, the voice of racism and anti-racism. And he's convinced me that racism is less about who you are than it's more about what you do. And if you don't attack racist policies, if you don't seek out racist policies and then change them, you're being a racist. And I commit to doing that as a legislator. Thanks. John Heinrich? I heard a lot about systemic racism after the, um, the killing of uh, George Floyd. And, um, and my question would be, why is it that in a city that hasn't had any Republicans around, Democrats have chosen from dog catcher up to the mayor, the city council, 
handpicked Chief Arredondo of the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, these are all their people. They haven't let a Republican within miles of that city for 30 years, I think. And somehow when something happens, they're able to point out to the suburbs and say, see, look at the systemic racism. I think systemic racism does exist. And I think the Democrats should stop engaging in it. They talk about Klan mentality. They're starting to separate groups, uh, pitting men and women against each other, pitting uh, different skin colors against each other. This is not helpful. Um, we, are, we should be united under one flag. And that flag represents opportunity for all. Thank you. Do you think the statewide police reforms passed by the legislature this summer are moving Minnesota in the right direction? And explain. John Heinrich. Unfortunately, overall, I don't think so. I did not vote for that bill when it hit the House floor. Uh, we heard uh, Senator Abler, a uh, Republican, uh, I think the Senate passed that bill unanimously. Um, I had some issues with it. I think a lot of the time what we do in St. Paul is we try to have a knee-jerk reaction and we say, nothing was done unless the legislature voted on something being done. Um, uh, again, which problems are we talking about? In the Minneapolis Police Department, that training was uh, you know, handpicked, authored by elected Democrats. The city council, the Chief Arredondo, handpicked and praised by Democrats. And so then to say that it was the their fault, um, I, I just think we should point the, the fault at that individual. I think our police are trained really well. Um, you know what, warrior training, it sounds scary. What warrior training talks about is preparing somebody to, in case there's a, vi a, a violent threat, a credible threat for them, and to always be prepared. And so we use these terms, warrior training, it sounds really scary. Um, I think they had really good training and they will continue to get good training. Thanks. Mike Erickson? Yeah, I, I do think it's moving in the right direction, but I think it, it is kind of like the old adage of, of picking the low-hanging fruit. I mean, those, those were things that needed to be done. And with respect to warrior training and treating, training you for a, a potential situation, you know, I had greater restrictions on using rule of force in the military, as I'm sure John probably did, than the Minneapolis Police Department or any other police department. I had to establish hostile intent before I could engage. And here, all there is has to be a perception of fear. So if you're going to define a solution for a problem, you have to first accurately define the problem. Assigning blame to the Democrats in Minneapolis or to the hand-picked Chief Arredondo is counterproductive and isn't going to do us a bit of good. So I would advocate getting some cooler heads together on both sides of the aisle, the great opportunity to collaborate, define with the law enforcement folks what their requirements are and what they can offload, and then train them and fund them to do that. Thank you. Do you support laws that require background checks on private gun sales and red flag laws which give law enforcement the ability to confiscate weapons from those believed to be a risk to themselves and others? Mike Erickson. Yeah, so the red flag laws is an easy one for me. Yes, I support those and, and for a variety of reasons. I mean, if, if the process is tight enough that it's not going to be uh, uh, taking a gun away on a whim, um, as you may not may or may not know, I lost a son to suicide, and I've been involved in suicide prevention for years. And there is a um, there's a concept called uh, acquired capability, where you can where somebody is thinking about it all along, and you can sense that that something's going on. And then there is an impulse component to it, and we can intervene at that impulse component and lessen the the number of suicides that are committed with a, a firearm. On the private gun sales, uh, you know, there, there are, uh, uh, what's the term, um, disqualifying things that exist. People shouldn't have guns. And we need to find a way to make sure that a private sale does not enable the sale of a gun to somebody who shouldn't have it. Thank you. John Heinrich. Can I have two minutes for this? No. Uh, <laughs> one minute for a question sometimes isn't enough. Well, I've wasted 15 seconds already. Um, so the two, uh, the two issues, gun, um, I, I voted against those, those two bills that came through, um, that uh, passed through the House. If we, if we had had a uh, Democrat-led um, uh, Senate, then I'm sure that those two extreme gun control measures would have been signed into law. 
Um, and that's unfortunate. The red flag language, uh, kind of the idea we're talking about around it, like, well, we need some sort of a process. We do. We already have a process where somebody that should not have guns can, can have those guns confiscated from them. Uh, but it takes uh, uh, due process. And so what red flag laws did essentially was kind of gut out some of that due process that we need. You, do, you are presumed innocent until proven guilty still in our country, thank God. And so the red flag laws, that specific bill and the way that it was written was not uh, the right way to do that. Gun show loophole, largely a fallacy. Every vendor at the gun show is a registered vendor with the ATF. You can't sell a gun to somebody as a private party if you're a gun show vendor. I'll help you guys out. What it is, is after people buy guns in the gun show, in theory, they could walk to the parking lot and then have a transaction. Thanks. Earlier it was stated wrong. Thank you. Thanks. As an elected official, would you work to support MnDOT's strategies to promote electric vehicles, including accelerated sales and use, and build out charging infrastructure? Explain. John Heinrich. Thanks for that question. This is, uh, you know, I sit on the transportation committee. Um, there's been bills brought forward to mandate uh, city buses transfer over to electric. We've been talking about um, just the reality of uh, lesser, lesser funding for our roads and bridges through gas tax because as people start to take on more um, interest into the electric vehicle market, um, that's just a reality. One thing I'd like to point out that I don't hear very often, there's a couple major um, minerals uh, that need to be mined uh, materials, uh, I should say, that need to be mined that go into electric vehicles. Uh, cobalt is one of those. We don't mine any cobalt in the United States of America. Major implement, cobalt, lithium, graphite. You know where a lot of that stuff comes out of? It comes out of the Congo. Child labor, forced labor, they don't have an EPA over there. We do a darn good job here in our country protecting our air and water and uh, not having our kids have forced labor. They don't do a very good job over that, there. So do your research, check out where a lot of the mir minerals that we need, we don't wanna mine them here, not in our backyard, but apparently we're okay mining them somewhere else to get those batteries. Mike Erickson. Yeah, so yes, I, I do. And you know, we're, we're a country that, that you know, we can launch a missile from the middle of the ocean and fly it through a window 1,500 miles away. I'm sure that we have the technical know-how to develop the battery storage, to develop the recharging capability that we need to be, have a more dense electric vehicle population. I said before, you need to accurately define the problem. The child labor laws in the Congo have nothing to do with promoting electric vehicles here. That's a separate problem, and it needs to be addressed. We need to go after that. We've gone after that in other places as well. And so we can do that and still promote electric vehicles. Um, I mean, it, it will be one of those uh, that probably is going to have to be slow rolled for a little bit because of the economic uh, conditions that we're in. But it's still a noble goal that I think we should pursue. Do you believe people convicted of felonies who are living in the community, not imprisoned, should have their right to vote restored? Mike Erickson. Yeah, I, I do. I think they've paid their price to, to society for the crime that they committed. Uh, my daughter is a prosecutor in Hennepin County, and she and I have had some conversations on this. And, um, you know, dads and daughters don't always agree, but this is one of the things that we do agree on, that they need to be into, reintegrated into society and be given a voice. They've committed their crime. They've paid their price. It's time to, to make them full-fledged citizens again. John Heinrich. Well, my opponent and I are going to agree on this. He said, um, paid their debt to society, paid the price. Um, did you know in our state you can be a convicted felon and vote if you've done, your, if you've done the time? So you can. So I, I think the, the, the question comes across possibly to some people who think, well, if they've had a, a felony on their record, they can't vote. That's, that's untrue. So I want to tell anybody that uh, feels like they have a criminal past and that they can't vote, um, no, you certainly can engage and vote. Um, now, the other, there should be some sort of, um, you know, rights that you don't get when you commit a felony against people and you're still serving your time. Uh, to have those people vote, um, I think is, uh, you know, it's, it's just a distortion of the process um, that we'd all like to see. 
Um, we want, we trust our neighbors. We want good members of society, good citizens to be able to vote. And if you've betrayed the public trust and, and you've committed a felony and you're still serving your time for that, um, then you should not be allowed to vote yet. But when you've completed your time, uh, like my opponent said, paid the debt, uh, paid the price, then you can vote. Thank you. Thank you. Upon the completion of the 2020 census, Minnesota will draft and enact new district maps called redistricting. The state legislature is responsible for drawing these maps. Do you support the current process or would you propose changes? Why or why not? John Heinrich. Well, I think we were fortunate to have Senator Abler here because he's been around for a couple of those processes, and that's uh, every 10 years for those of you doing math. Um, I think what's going to happen is uh, if, you know, the reality is, is, is this. Uh, elections do have consequences, whatever side that you're on. In Minnesota, we've just had a split legislature or a Republican governor in um, uh, the Senate and the House. We're both Democrat for a time. And uh, now we have a Democrat governor and uh, a, a House that's controlled by the Democrats and a Senate that's controlled by the Republicans. So the way I see it working out is this cycle is it's probably going to go to the courts if we can't decide. And apparently that's what's happened about the last 30 years in our state. Um, and as I talk to people around the, uh, the Capitol, it seems that uh, by and large, they think that the lines are actually pretty fair. There's obviously some disagreements on both sides, but by and large, overall throughout our state, they they feel that way. So the reality is if the Republicans were to lose the Senate this election, then the Democrats will certainly draw the lines themselves. So it'll probably look like a pie shape or something like that. I don't know. Mike <laughs> Erickson. You. Yeah, I, I agree with John that elections have uh, consequences, but one of them should not be the perpetuation of illegal gerrymandering. So I don't like the new or the existing process where the, the ruling party, if you will, gets to select the lines. I, I would advocate, uh, as I think Jim did up here, for a, a board that is appointed you know, either jointly by, by representatives from both parties or perhaps from a, a trusted nonpartisan judge. Um, and, and if it's going to end up in the courts anyways, it might as well start in the courts. So I would advocate for a nonpartisan board. Which, which one issue do you think is most important to work on with legislature, legislators across the aisle? Mike Erickson. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if there's an, an important issue that's, you know, one issue that's more important than the other. Um, over the past few years, we've kind of proven that we just can't work across the aisle. I mean, Jim gave a couple of examples, and that's good. But I, I think Probably one of the most important issues facing us right now is the public safety issue and the reimagining of the police force. And I think what we need to do is decompose that into some smaller parts. We need to find one, and, and I, I would be committed to doing this, find one that you could reach across the aisle, find resolution on that one issue, celebrate that success, and then build that success into greater success until you've been able to... To, to eat the whole pie, so to speak. John Heinrich. Uh, well, I have worked across the aisle with uh, Democrat legislators, uh, both in the House and in the Senate, on uh, business issues. I can uh, tell you of one as uh, Representative uh, Heather Edelson out of Edina. Um, uh, pretty b uh, blue Democrat voting community there, but very strong in uh, small businesses and uh, fairly affluent as well. Uh, we've been able to work together um, on some business um, things and, and talking about tax, state taxes and things like that. Uh, another big one is uh, veterans, you know, people from all sides. And I think I thank my opponent for his service in the military and, and respect him for that. Um, that's something that uh, that he could engage in, you know, and that I can engage in um, just in our personal lives and in the legislature um, to come behind our veterans. That's something that ties our community together and really support them. Another huge one I've worked with Representative Zach Stevenson and Senator Hoffman and Many others, uh, Representative Dan Wolgamont, all Democrats, he's out of uh, St. Cloud, on uh, issues on Highway 10 through Anoka. So uh, a lot of that's geopolitical. A lot of the transportation issues are, are, can be a more of a geopolitical process. So it's been a pleasure to work with uh, members on the other side. Thank you. What do you believe to be key elements of compromise? John Heinrich. Well, uh, great question. I think I just li listed off maybe a couple of them. We can, we've certainly found some compromise um, to make sure that our businesses find Minnesota a lucrative place to keep and run their business. 
and for members of our community to stay here instead of leaving and, and taking their money to Florida or wherever they go where there might be um, some better tax implications for, for them. So I'm committed to working with others, and I think that I found a lot of support on the other side of the aisle as well uh, to, com to, to commit to making sure that Minnesota is a lucrative place to run your business and raise your family and stay here in retirement as well. Mike Erickson. Yeah, so um, I think the key element of compromise is to recognize that both sides are coming into the negotiations with noble goals. You know, they're not the bad guys and I'm the good guy or I'm the bad guy and they're the good guy. The other thing is ha to have a legitimate list of issues that you can prioritize, that there are things, you know, this is a must have. I'm not going to compromise on this. This is something that I'm willing to talk about and this one's a throwaway. And as you get into the negotiations, if they want you to, to offer up a throwaway, give it to them. You don't fight about it, you just give it to them. And throughout the process, you listen to each other because they may very well be able to educate you that some of your must-have items eh, maybe really aren't must-haves and you'd be able to work on those. So it's going into it realizing that you both have noble interests at heart and listening to the other party. Now we've come to the last question. And that question is, how can public participation and transparency regarding the legislative process be improved? Mike Erickson. Well, I think it's, you know, Jim mentioned it earlier, just a lot of it is making yourself available, making yourself approachable, um, listening. I, a couple of times tonight, I've mentioned the black students that were at the city council meeting uh, a while ago. Um, you know, a feature of my education position is that we would provide free education for two years after uh, post-secondary work. And I thought that, you know, you've, you've got these kids that are in uh, advanced placement and post-secondary education options. They get a half, a, half a, a college career in before they actually get to college. So it would give them an opportunity to get a college degree essentially for free. Well, I listened to these kids last month, and they said, those courses aren't available to us. As black students, they're not as available to us as they are to the white students. And so you need to listen to them. I mean, you, you want a case of systemic racism? It was unintended, but that would have been one. So I listened to them, and now I'll modify my, my position on education to include opportunities for them to engage in AP and PSEO. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, now you have one minute for your closing statement, and we'll start with, uh, whoops, you didn't answer the question of the <laughs> transparency, <laughs> did you? Okay, John Heinrich. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity, that's okay. Um, and so I, I think one thing would be, I, I mentioned civics earlier, I think as our, um, especially high school students, start to learn the process and how government works, it's maybe a little bit less intimidating for them. Um, I know for, for me, before I got really involved in, um, in local politics, it was when you're outside looking in, you think, wow, these people are, are really smart and they know things I don't and, and I can't do that. And, and a lot of the time that's, that's not true. Kids need to be told that they are capable and that they can have a voice in the process and that they can start thinking about some of the issues that are, that are tough to think about and sometimes tough to talk about. Um, and so we need to promote a, an environment in our um, high schools and, uh, and in our college campuses of one that's, um, it's okay to have a healthy debate and talk about tough topics. Um, and so it's, uh, another thing that I do is I talk to uh, a lot of kids at the doors throughout Anoka and Ramsey, I think just direct engagement and asking them about what they think um, and showing up to events and things like that. I think that's really helpful as well. Thanks. Now we'll go on to your one minute closing statements and we'll start with John Heinrich. Well, thank you so much again to the league and, uh, and those of you here and those of you watching at home on uh, whichever uh, camera that is. Uh, so my priorities again uh, for uh, this next session would be uh, to continue to double down on the work, uh, the groundwork I've already laid with other legislators and our county commissioners and our cities on our transportation needs. Our local transportation is um, a nonpartisan, bipartisan issue that we all care about. We want faster commute times. Um, we want safety upgrades. We want uh, first responders to be able to get across those railroad tracks in, in a timely manner on Highway 47 and then on, on Sunfish, 
Boulevard and on Ramsey Boulevard. So we have some major issues there. Um, I'd also ask that you send me back to the legislature again for another session so I can continue to proudly work on veterans issues. And again, I'm gonna request that I, um, I try to get on the, uh, the uh, committee, uh, public safety committee. That's gonna be real important for our community as I've, as I've talked to people. Um, that's something that they really care about and they're concerned about um, lately. So I ask for your vote. You can find me at heinrichforhouse.com and vote for me in November. Thank you. Thanks. Mike Erickson. Yeah, I, I echo John's thanks to the league and their co-sponsors for putting this on. It's, uh, it's a unique campaign uh, season. We don't get a chance to get out and talk to folks face to face, but at least here, um, they can see who we are. They can see the passion and what we're, we're talking about. And um, so, you know, I, I think unprecedented has become probably the most overused word in the English language, but it, but it does accurately describe the conditions that we're in. And as I said earlier, the same old solutions aren't going to get us out of, of a new situation. And so um, tonight you've heard some of the differences, policy differences between John and I. And I think it's important that if I'm going to ask for your vote, and I'm going to in a few seconds, that I go deeper than, than some sound bites and, and bullet points. And I'd invite you to go out to my website at www.mikeericksonforhouse.com. I posted position papers on education and healthcare. Take a look at them, download them, take a look at them, let me know what you think. And then come back in a couple of weeks, I'll be posting papers on the economy and the environment. Um, and so I, I'm at the seconds where I'm gonna ask you for your vote. I respectfully ask you to vote for me. Um, anytime between September 18th and November 3rd would be great. And then when you do, I ask that you call your friends and your relatives and recommend that they vote for me as well. Well, thank you both for sharing your views with the public by participating in this Meet the Candidates form. Thanks to our co-sponsors, the North Suburban Optimist Club and the North Metro Chamber of Commerce. The League of Women Voters has supported informed voting for over 100 years. In the year 2020, we have many options for how we vote. Exercise your right to vote. For voting information, visit mn votes.org. Thanks.